This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Levijou. Welcome to 2017 and episode 31 of the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast. Uh, before we get started, since the recording of this of this podcast, news has come out of the passing of Carl McGowan. Uh, Carl was one of the early interviews that we conducted, and that interview was featured in the first Volleyball Coaching Wizards book. Uh, he, by all accounts, is perhaps the most influential person in volleyball coaching, certainly one of. And while some people may agree or disagree with certain elements of his philosophy, there's little to argument to the fact that you know, anywhere you go these days, you can see the influence that he had on how we train teams and our overall philosophy of, of training and player development. So he's someone that will be sorely missed. Uh, in memorial of, of Carl and his contributions, if you go to the Volleyball Coaching Wizards blog, you will find that we've released uh, the the full text of his, his interview. Um, free access, you can go and get it, pass it around. You know, a big part of what we're after with the Wizards project is, is to share all this information as broadly as, as we can get. And certainly, you know, Carl's influence is something that we want as many people in the volleyball community to be aware of as as possible because it's, a, it's an important part of keeping the history of our sport and of our uh, of our coaching part of the sport alive and, and in the consciousness of everybody available. So if you haven't already checked it out or, or otherwise um, read or listened to Carl's interview, please um, go ahead and check that out and um, get it for yourself and enjoy. Now, in this particular episode, uh, we talk about the the American Volleyball Coaches Association convention, the ABCA, where I was a presenter. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago in the middle of December during the NCAA Women's Division One Final Four. Uh, and I share a few of, of the experiences and we get into some discussion about um, some of the stuff that John Spira of the U.S. national team and also collegiately from UCLA talked about in, in a couple of the talks that he did. I'm sure we'll probably circle around to the convention and address some of the other things that, that were discussed. Um, but you'll find the focus here kind of drills down on, on a couple elements that, that John got into. So enjoy. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to the ABCA convention, uh, actually for two purposes. The primary purpose from a wizard's perspective was going there to present um, basically a session on uh, now I won't say all the things that we've learned from all the almost 40 interviews that we've done up to this point, but certainly a fair chunk of them in terms of what commonalities we see in the interviews um, between the wizards and where they tend to, make, I won't say disagree, but have different perspectives on things. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the rest of, of my attendance there was, you know, going to sessions and getting to meet up with people, including some of the wizards and some of the wizards in the book, especially, but a couple others were also there on hand, either doing yep. their own presentations or, um, or just being there as attendees on one level or another. Uh, so it mm -hmm. was, it was an interesting experience. Um, the, the, it started off with the pre-convention uh, seminar, which was basically, well, it was meant to be three coaches talking. Uh, John Spra for the USA Men, uh, Tom Black was there representing the USA Women, and Giovanni Gadetti uh, was the third member of that, uh, talking about from his perspective coaching the Dutch women. Uh, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. of travel, Giovanni couldn't talk this started on Wednesday he couldn't do his stuff until Friday so he kind of did it solo where the other two did a, a joint pair of sessions um, but in any case it was it was some really good stuff mostly yep, okay. talking about um, 
Well, I mean, there was there was a couple of court sessions with with all of them. Uh, Giovanni did one on blocking and defense, and uh, the other two guys did a, a kind of a mixture of different things. But in terms of the the off court session, the, the seminar stuff, it was basically this was our experience at the Olympics, um, and they came at it from a, a few different perspectives. Tom Black kind of almost did like a match by match. This is how things went. Um, mm -hmm. Giovanni kind of really got into, I mean, he, he talked kind of about the whole development of that team from the time he took over through the Olympics and their, you know, their process of getting there and then how things went while they were there and did a, a statistical breakdown of the players in all the positions just to, to kind of show the, you know, the hitters and the, the centers and whatnot in the top among the teams that were in the medal round. Okay. Um, Sprott was kind of a little bit in the middle and perhaps got more philosophical than the others in a few mm. ways and and certainly quite emotional at the end um, which was was interesting and perhaps surprising to see um, and it it happened when he was kind of describing the last part of the Olympics which is the closing ceremonies and he had talked about how in his experience prior no more than a couple of guys from the men's team ever really went to closing ceremonies. It was just not something that they cared to do. Um, but this time, the whole group decided to go together. Uh, and literally, even talking about it, brought them to tears. And because it was, a, it, was a, it was such an expression of the team. Um, okay. And clearly, that was something that they worked hard on throughout the, the cycle. Um, and and especially and he talked a lot about how they needed to f integrate the younger players with the older players and he talked quite a bit about the difference between like a Reed Pretty who's, who's been there several times mm -hmm. and younger guys um, whether it be Micah Christensen or or uh, the, you know the two young Jesse, outside hitters, Jeske, uh, yeah, yeah Jeske and Russell and, and uh, Sander, and just how you're talking basically millennials versus I don't know whatever you consider to be pretty I guess Gen X, um, and they're they're very different mentalities. And, and he talked about how at one point he, Reed came to him and said, "I don't know how to communicate with these guys um, because obviously what he was used to." From his experience with with the players of his generation was not not working with the younger guys. Yeah. Um, so it was like I say, it was a little bit of a mixed bag in in terms of those sorts of things. John did get a little a little technical at times in terms of of you know serving. He he actually made the comment that he thinks serving at least in the men's game. I don't know if, if he was extending this to the women's game as well is the area where he thinks the next kind of significant development in the sport will happen. He didn't give any clue as to where he thought that might be, but he, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But he, he, he brought up the idea that in terms of the jump serve, there's a, this 20% error threshold that is really hard to break. He kind of compared it to batting 300 in baseball. Whereas, yep. you know, if you can get 20%, only 20% jump serves are better than, you know, you're effectively, like, you know, an all-star. Um, and so that, that was kind of an interesting thing because there was, as always, there's a lot of talk, especially on the men's side of the game about, you know, what do you do to try to, you know, how can we cut the errors down? And, and some of it is, is a technical discussion and some of it is a, an aesthetics discussion. And it can be hard to separate those two things. Um, yep. Yeah. So, uh, any comments before I ramble on any further? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really interested uh, where serving is going to be the. It's going to make the next big step because I'm not really sure that. I, off the top of my head, I can see where where that would be. So, um. well, yeah, agreed. And and 
I, but I think that's kind of the point is that if we knew where it was going to go, we'd, we'd already be going there. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, you know, <laughs> it was a little bit surprising because, yeah, you're right. You look at you look at serving and go, it's kind of simple. But maybe he's thinking multidimensionally in ways that others aren't. Well, no, I'm not really thinking about that. I'm just thinking um, the uh, guys are already serving pretty hard. There's not much area left in mm -hmm. terms of uh, speed. Um, so people will get better at serving over time. So they'll make so they'll make maybe a few less errors, but I wouldn't imagine that was going to be a significant number. Uh, if if you go in the other direction and say tactics, talk about serving tactics, that there can be a jump there. Maybe that level of power with more control is the area that you can go. But I'm not, I wouldn't say that I can't see a really big jump there. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's an interesting interesting thought experiment I guess I'm going to have to make now. Yeah. Well, and what was interesting related to that is he talked about working with Andrea Becker, who's mm -hmm. his assistant slash psychology coach, mm -hmm. and, and her giving him very specific directions on how to handle jump servers from a psychological perspective in that previously, and I don't know how much this extends to USA team, or it was more specifically with this college guys at UCLA, but there she basically told him to take the take the restraints off of players by focusing less on the error side of things and and reducing the amount of targeting that they try to do uh, to 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 the basically the point where. They more or less go back and rip without yeah. too much consideration as to where they want to start. Mm -hmm. because, and, and I think from Andrew's perspective, the feeling was the targeting side of things was jamming guys up. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard Reed pretty talk on the net live early in the Sparore era about a change in the focus on serving uh, less being less on errors and more, uh, particularly at times of the set. So they always serve the same, regardless of what what the score was, um, as being one change there. So I can I can follow those those things and uh, not to focus on errors. Uh, I think it's not the most obvious thing in the world, but it's. You know, it's coaching instruction 101. People focus on what you tell them about. If right. you don't, if you talk about errors, people focus on errors. So, I mean, that's, you know, like it's logical. Um, maybe you needed a psychologist to point that out to a coach uh, because coaches get caught up in their own little worlds, maybe. But, right. Um, but, yeah, um, that that's something that I've discussed before. Is is uh, about competition in practice. When you have competition in practice, all the time, people focus on only on winning and never on improving. Or if you punish errors or whatever it is. So, you know, right. Like I said, this is about framing feedback, framing information from the beginning. Um. Yeah, it's I. I would be surprised if that wasn't already widely done. So, if I look at the, uh, if you want to talk about the top five jump servers in the world, I'm fairly confident that none of them serve the position. So, and none of them think about errors. Well, um, and that did that, uh, that did come up. That did come up. Yeah. Um, and. You know, they talked about a guy like Clay Stanley. And, yep. and they said, you know, Clay was about one in three in terms of missed serves. He mm -hmm. says, but you, but you accepted that. Because on the other two out of three, he was putting so much pressure on the other team that 
that's exactly what you wanted. So you, you yeah. said, okay, he's gonna he's gonna make a few more errors than the rest of the guys, but he's doing more damage. So we we take the mm -hmm. trade off. Yeah. And did they win that trade off? Um, I th probably most. Well, yeah, because I think Sparag was talking about in the last Olympics when, or in 2008 when Stanley was on, that was it. You know, they won. <laughs> it was, it was pretty much, I mean, obviously it wasn't just that, but yeah. And, uh, and they actually talked about it in terms of Anderson. You know, when Anderson was serving lights out, then you yep. know, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, yes. Yes. I, the reason I ask is because to me, the most important figure in the serving is the number of points you win when somebody goes back to serve so you talk about most of the time when people talk in men's volleyball about serving they they talk about the point scoring skill of serving mm -hmm. but like everything in volleyball it's about the interaction of the team and how the the parts of the game function together so you can have a psychological threat of a great server but if he doesn't actually score points when he goes back to serve, then, or your team rather doesn't serve points, score points, then it doesn't really matter what right. the psychological point is. Right. So, you know, I have a guy, one guy who serves at one fifteen kilometers an hour, and one guy who might crack ninety five on a good day. And uh, the 95 guy, we win more points when he goes back to serve. Okay. Is that the now, guy that you recently described struggled when you put him in rotation one? Uh, no. No, that, that was the setter. Okay. So one, I can say, one is Hidalgo, who goes back and has a really high ace rate and a, a really manageable error rate. And we win 40% of the time when he goes back to serve. Mm -hmm. And Tuzinski, who serves more or less always to the same position with a really low error rate, we win 40% of the time when he goes back to serve. And for those listeners who don't know, 40% is very high in men's volleyball. Uh, our average <laughs> is 34. Right, exactly. So it's, uh, it's really high. Yeah. Um, Actually, related to that, you bring up speeds. One of the more interesting things that uh, came up when Spraw was in the panel discussion with the other men's volleyball coaches yep. was somebody asked the question of what speed. And it was kind of in, in relationship to uh, at what point do you say, okay, you don't serve hard enough, you're going to do a jump float. And all of the coaches pretty much said, we don't use radar guns anymore. Um, I think one of them, it might have been the Stanford coach, said at one point they said if you can't hit at least, I think they were saying 55 miles an hour or something like that, then you're doing a, a jump float. But they all basically said they, they've gotten rid of radar guns. And and it, Tom Black said the same thing with regards to the USA women that Carr just tossed them out, uh, basically with the philosophy that if you get the trajectory of the serve right, then speed takes care of itself. Yeah. Which I found kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I find it interesting too because uh, if you talk about speed, you have clear and concise feedback. If you talk about tra trajectory, you have not clear and concise feedback. So, um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, uh it can seem obvious, but but 58 is 58. That one went underneath the top of the antenna is still not quite as clear. Well, that, that so. brings up a question that, that I don't think anybody thought to ask. Um, certainly, I didn't until, until just now. In setting, there's, I don't know if you've seen this or, or used this before, there's the NOAA device, uh, which basically lets you track the trajectory of your sets so yeah you know, and, it, and it tells you it gives you an audio feedback 32 degrees yeah. 40 degrees whatever yeah um, I, you use that sort of thing to obviously be consistent with your with your set patterns uh -huh. I, I wonder if anybody's actually used that or something like that with serving 
Because if they if you do, then there's the consistency of feedback you were just talking about. Yeah. Or if they use something else, you know, video or whatever, to say, yeah, okay, that's your trajectory. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. No. I don't use the speed gun very often um, because it's not a really big focus of mine, speed by itself. Mm -hmm. um, also because some guys serve hard and some guys don't and it's um, yeah, it's a it's a fixed number more or less. the The only thing is to encourage players to serve harder at practice. Although, <laughs> what I find in my practices is that players don't serve maximally in in practice. They serve uh, to keep the drill going, right, and right. so as not to make an error. But I've had other coaches say to me that they can't get their players to serve as hard in a game as in practice. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of coaches have that have that struggle. Uh, I don't have that struggle. I don't. I couldn't even begin to answer that question. I've <laughs> never had a player who served harder in practice than he did in a game. Uh, and when you say in practice, do you mean during a game like? sort of exercise or do you mean just going back uh, and wrapping out some serves at all in uh definitely not in a scrimmage uh, in a, any game like practice and almost i i can't think of any who did it in us in serving any sort of serving drill of which i do hardly any anyway so right no i'm, I'm and i say this because I can see situations where coaches are doing some sort of serving a passing exercise where the focus is on the receivers and, you know, get so many reps or so many executions or, you know, balls to target or whatever, where the focus really isn't on the servers. So in order to finish the drill, the servers are not going to go as hard because they want to they want to make sure there's enough good balls and or the coach punishes the servers for making errors because it's slowing down the drill. Or something yeah. along those lines. Uh, yeah, I, and I know those considerations. And maybe it's more, maybe you see it more in the women than the men. I don't know. But what I normally try to, to do to make sure those things don't happen is make it competitive on both sides in some fashion. Uh, or if it's in a more of a game-like situation, give the servers a second serve so they can go and rip that first one if that's what they, they choose to do. So they get the practice of doing it, so it's not so unusual in a game. In uh, I do a lot of work, I do a lot with second serves. Mm -hmm. Most most drills, most days have a second serve, um, but that's partly because of the servers. I want them to to go close to maximum, mm -hmm. but also it's because I don't do much serve and reception outside of scrimmages. So. Right. I want to make sure my receivers get to receive. Yep, agreed. So it's it's both sides. Now, having said that, and we're we're digressing, but we always digress, so let's go with it. When I was coaching at Svetla, I actually had players push back on on second serves, uh -huh. and their their argument was, "But we can't do that in a game." Which is, uh, it's true. Obviously, it is. <laughs> you can't do it in a game. Yeah. Um, not most games anyway. And so they they were feeling like going after that first serve wasn't replicating to them the the approach that they took in a game situation. Mm -hmm. You know, so what's your response to that sort of critique? Uh it's definitely it's definitely true, but I've never had pushback on it. The players what often happens if you give them two serves is they don't pay attention to the first one because they know they've got a second so the the my solution to that is that it depends from day to day mm -hmm. so we have different the closer we get to the game the less likely we are to repeat surfs right so the beginning of the week will definitely repeat the last day before the game will definitely repeat but that's normally non-scored practice anyway uh, but there, there's normally a day where all serves count. 
Um, what I've actually started to do a little bit is uh, different kinds of serves get you a, a repeat um, because I want to focus a lot on a lot more on not serving into the net. Um, so I've done it. Uh, can do it. So if you serve into the net, you don't get to repeat. If yeah. you serve out, you get to repeat. So things like that. Yeah, we we do that sort of thing too. Whereas, yeah, a negative mistake, you don't you don't get another shot. <laughs> you know, like you say, if you miss it out of bounds, yeah. fine. Okay, go again. But yeah, yeah. Then that's the mistake that we don't we don't want to accept. Um, all right, we're we're probably getting close to our time here. Any other points that we that are worth hitting on from, I guess, primarily what Spira said, because that's where we went with this. I, uh, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic about serving. I think if if I were forced to say where I thought that the game is going to make the biggest change, I think the game is going to make the biggest change in uh, transition attack. I think that's where the where the next development of the game is is going to go. Okay. Uh, there's going to be less high balls. There's going to be more variation. There's going to be more non-setters um, setting at different tempos, not only setters setting high balls. Uh, that's what you're we're already seeing, and that's why Engerpet is in World of Volley four times every week, but. Um, this is it's if you actually watch the game everything he does is completely obvious and uh, as more and more players young players see what he's doing and more and more coaches uh, open their eyes um, and realize it's not some guy some lunatic but actually a guy <laughs> mate, using the uh, using his tools of perception to see obvious areas of weakness then that's what we're going to that's my opinion where the change is going to be actually bringing him up um reminds me of something that get talked about and and i don't know if this is with spara specifically or if it might have come up with somebody else but it it came up in a discussion of finding ways to avoid being tripled in terms of you know your offense and as you say, mm-hmm. it's a, it's primarily that's happening in a transition situation, yes. Where the the ball's been dug off, and now everybody knows you have to go to the pin, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they they showed, or at least talked about Engapath and how the fact that he goes up and and jumps, whether he intends to swing or not, forces the opponent to hold, and therefore reduces the chances of there being a triple. Um, so there was there was a fair bit of discussion on strategies i suppose you could say for reducing the number of blockers outside of the normal you know run the quick to to freeze the middle etc you know the standard well, that's that's exactly what it that's exactly what i said it's the threat of the second contact it's a threat of attacking the second contact mm-hmm. opens up possibilities for the third yep yep and until the last 20 years volleyball's been played as in, if you don't have a perfect opportunity, you set a high ball and take no risk. And yeah. what we're learning from Anger Pet and a few other people like him is that it's not a high risk. No, the, the higher risk is different. to hit against a triple. The higher, the, the least successful action that you can make, the one that leads to the that has the lowest opportunity for success mm-hmm. is to hit a high ball against a triple block right so exactly. um, like i said it's it's actually blindingly obvious when you watch him play in person which i did <laughs> yes most of us only get to watch him in video clips luckily he's on world of volley four times a week yeah this is true he is the man um so does that suggest that we're going to have Liberos running quick, you know, tempo balls to the pin? I mean, uh, they already do. Yeah, I was going to say I can I can already picture the Brazilians doing this, uh, and, I'm and sure, I'm sure others. 
if I had uh, to go back to the Olympics, I think the big mistake that the French team did was they didn't do that at the Olympics. Do you mean they got conservative? They, they got really conservative, and that's not the way they play. No. Fair point. Okay. Well, we can wrap it up there then. All right. Beautiful. Yes. Love your work, John. Love your work, John Sparrow. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.